This is going to be, is a changed life required for salvation. Many sincere people believe that every true born-again Christian will eventually show that they have a changed life. They also believe that if they don't show a changed life, then the person never really got saved to begin with. And there is no doubt that when I see a person continuously committing a sin that I wouldn't commit myself, it does come to my mind, they probably aren't saved. And you can't help but think that because we can only see the outside of a person. I can't look at a person and see on their inside just like God does. But here are some reasons why I don't believe that every Christian will show a changed life outwardly. Number one, because the struggle is real with the flesh. When we get born again, our flesh doesn't get born again. Paul talks about the works of the flesh. In the book of Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 21, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice that Paul says if we walk in the Spirit. He said if we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And when Christians name off sins they believe another Christian will not commit if they're truly saved, they will mention fornication, drunkenness, adultery, murder, whatever else. But Paul warns Christians not to commit these works of the flesh that he's got listed here. And if he's warning Christians not to commit adultery, not to fornicate, not to get drunk, then that shows it's possible for a Christian who is born again to commit those sins. Although many teach change life required for salvation, they mostly won't teach that a person must be sinless. They just teach a person will have a change of lifestyle after they get saved. And if they don't have this change of lifestyle, then they say that person really didn't get saved because when you get saved, you become a new creature. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. However, if we use this verse to teach a person will have outward evidence through a changed lifestyle showing their salvation, then literally all sins would have to be dropped, not just those big sins that everyone looks down on. You won't be able to just drop drugs and fornication and drinking because the verse said, all things are become new. You would also have to drop your complaining, your foolish thinking, your pride, your jealousy. And there are sins that Christians commit regularly which don't show a changed lifestyle when they commit those sins. They're showing that they still have their sinful flesh, as we all do, even after salvation. And these sins just aren't looked at as sinful, like shacking up and smoking weed and committing adultery is looked at. They are sins on the inside that others can't see. Envy, pride, jealousy, the foolish thinking. And there's sins behind closed doors. Somebody could live a great life outwardly in public and then come home and sin behind closed doors. And there are some things that I quit doing when I got saved that I just quit instantly 
But there are a lot of sins I still commit that I committed before I got saved. And I'd be lying if I claimed to not be a sinner every day. Everyone sins every single day. I'm sure I sin somehow every day. And this is without cussing, without fornicating, without listening to filthy music or watching dirty movies. There's sins that we commit because we're still sinners after salvation. Paul didn't put that list of sins in Galatians to give you permission to commit those sins. We shouldn't commit those sins because we can, but just because we have eternal security doesn't mean we should sin. We should, should abstain from those sins, and there is still a consequence to sinning. And he said, they which commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And this means you won't have any inheritance in the kingdom. You'll still go in the kingdom, but you're not going to rule as much as you would have had you lived like you should have on this earth. And when you get saved, a struggle begins. Because the struggle is real with the, with the flesh. A war begins, and you are constantly fighting the flesh. And most likely the sins of your flesh... The ones that it loved before salvation, it is going to want those sins after salvation. And many times a person will give up their biggest sins the day they get saved. And this isn't true for everyone. I gave up sinful music when I got saved and I haven't listened to it since, at least for the purpose of entertainment. I have heard it in stores and I have researched it to teach against it. But to listen to it just for pleasure is something I am not tempted to do. However, my mu my flesh still likes the same music, the same wicked music that I listened to before I got saved. If I hear that music, my flesh still likes it. Even though there's something in me that absolutely hates it and despises it. And that shows your two natures. You got the new man inside. The Holy Spirit hates that stuff. And there's something inside you that's against that. And then you got the old man, the flesh, that still likes that music. So, I mean, for me, it's not much of a battle with the music anymore. But my flesh still enjoys that wicked music if I hear it. And this isn't true for everyone. Some people may still struggle with music after salvation. And then I may struggle with the sin that they don't struggle with. There are other sins I struggle with. As we all do, and even as Paul did in Romans seven fourteen through 25, it gives a great description of Paul and his dealings with sin. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into ca captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul calls himself a wretched man. He knows he's a wretch. The difference between a person that's saved and a person that's not saved is one is a saved sinner and one's a lost sinner. You're still a sinner. Your flesh still sins after salvation. You don't have to sin, but you have a free will and every sin that you do after salvation is done of your own free will. The Apostle Paul knew we still sin after salvation, and he knew that he still sinned after salvation himself. But the people who teach a changed life is re required for salvation will say, yeah, but we aren't saying you'll be sinless. 
But the thing is, to teach the change life stuff, you basically have to teach that a person is going to be sinless after salvation for it to make sense. Or teach some sins prove you aren't saved, and then some sins you get a pass for. And this gives that person the ability to decide who is saved and who isn't saved based on a list of standards they have. And even the people who believe you can lose your salvation, they have a list of sins that you, if you commit, then you're going to lose it, such as adultery, shacking up. But there's sins that they can commit, like gossiping and complaining and worrying and foolish thinking. And they're not going to teach that you can lose salvation over those sins. So I don't believe everyone who is saved shows a changed life outwardly because with the flesh, the struggle is real. Not only because the struggle is real, but because of the standard the Bible gives. I don't believe a changed life is required because of the standard the Bible gives. What is the standard? There is only one standard, and that is faith in the gospel. It is obedience of faith. Have you been obedient in believing the gospel? Paul gives the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and he teaches us Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is the gospel one has to believe to be saved. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you say it is only faith in the gospel that saves a person, someone may jump up and say, well, that's easy believism. But no, it isn't. For someone to put their trust in the gospel, they are admitting that they aren't good enough to make it to heaven. Why would you put your trust in something to get you to heaven if you think you're good enough to get to heaven? And they are admitting they can't save themselves. Because they are believing on Jesus Christ to save them. They are acknowledging they are a sinner. Because if you believe the gospel, the gospel says Jesus Christ died for our sins. If you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins and you're accepting Jesus Christ as the payment for sin, then you've already acknowledged you're a sinner. And who told you that you were a sinner? The Holy Spirit. The devil's not going to come and say, he'll, t he'll tell you about your sins but he's not going to come and say you're a sinner and you need to believe on Jesus Christ. Who's the one that tells you that? The Holy Spirit tells you you're a sinner, tells you you need to believe in Jesus Christ, and that shows that you're under conviction. That shows that you're being dealt with, that you're being drawn by God. So um, they're believing on Jesus Christ to save them. They are acknowledging they are a sinner because they are believing he died for their sins according to the Scriptures. And then them same guys may say, well, they have to be under conviction. But I mean, what do you think conviction is? If the person knows they are a sinner, they know they can't save themselves, and they have heard the gospel and are willing to believe it, what is keeping them from getting saved? Other than a confused preacher saying it just isn't their time yet. I mean, what do they think has to happen? Some mystical thing has to come over your body and you're shivering and things like that. The requirements for a person to be eligible to be saved is they need to know they're a sinner because they need to know why they need to be saved. They need to know what they need to be saved from. And they need to know Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. They need to know the gospel. They need to know that Jesus Christ died for their sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And nothing's keeping a person from being saved. God gives every person the opportunity to come to him as the guilty sinner they are and believe on him to save them. You hear preachers say, well, this person had to wait another 23 years before they had a chance to be saved again. And that's not true if a person knows they're a sinner, knows they're going to hell, and they're desiring to be saved, then they can be saved at that time. They don't have to wait until some super conviction comes along because they are already under conviction. And do you think the devil is going to tell them that they are a sinner on their way to hell and tell them that they need to be saved? That is the Holy Spirit that's telling them that. And every person who experiences this may not be busting out in tears 
and holding the pew in front of them so hard that their knuckles are turning white. They may not even be in a local church. The standard to be saved in the Bible is believing the gospel. The person knows they're a sinner, knows they're going to hell, and that means they're being drawn by the Holy Spirit. And what more do we need to say that person's under conviction? I don't like the term easy believism because it is easy to believe the gospel. What I am against is someone saying, just pray this prayer and you'll be saved. With the person not understanding the gospel or the fact that they are a sinner. The person needs to know they are a sinner because they need to know why they need a Savior. And they need to know who the Savior is and what He did for them. But the standard is believing the gospel and I'm not going to add anything to that whatsoever. So I don't believe a changed life is required for salvation because the struggle is real with the flesh. And the standard the Bible gives and the Bible gives individual examples of saved people committing sin in the Bible. Outwardly in these situations, they aren't showing a changed life. There are people in the Bible who are saved and not showing a changed life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, it said, it is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up. Uh, the people who are, these people are saved that are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you, for verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So there's a man committing fornication with his father's wife. He's saved, yet he's committing fornication committing incest so today these preachers or teachers who teach that a person will have a changed life if they saw this man he's he's out in the world doing fornication they would say he's most he's not saved he's not he doesn't have a changed life and then even the people in the corinthian church they're puffed up it calls them carnal they're causing division. They have envy and strife. That's not showing a big changed life. That's not showing a lot of outward evidence. And then you have people that'll say, if a person is committing adultery and getting drunk, then they're not really saved. But yet you have Christians over here who are envying and have a lot of pride and jealousy, but that person's saved. You can't have it both ways. They they would both have to not be saved if it had anything to do with a person, what a person is doing in the flesh. So he commits fornication to the point it was known in the church. The Corinthians were sinning just by being too easy on him and not doing anything about it. He was saved, yet he had a sinful lifestyle. And to the average person today, they would teach he wasn't saved, yet he was. And next we see that the Corinthians themselves were carnal. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So, man, look at all that stuff they're doing. They're carnal. They're envying. They have strife. They walk as men. Uh, this The list goes on of how bad the Corinthians are, yet they're still saved. And Paul isn't saying, well, if you're like this, you're not really saved. They are full of envy and strife, and these are sins that can be committed habitually every day by carnal Christians. Are they saved or false converts? Well, Paul teaches they are saved, but they definitely haven't changed their life concerning these sins. They may have put away some other stuff. 
and they may not be drinking or fornicating or smoking, but they are jealous and giving heed to unclean spirits. James 3.16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And there are Christians who may not whore around or drink beer, but they have envy in their hearts. They gossip. And the Bible speaks against these things as well. Also, what about the sin of gossiping, as I've been saying? The book of James says the tongue is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And one of the most talked about sins in the Bible is sins of the mouth. Things that come out of your wicked mouth. And we have to be honest. The Bible teaches that there are worldly, carnal Christians who do not look like Christians at all if you see them. While there are lost people who look pretty good on the outside and can deceive people. Second Timothy 4.10 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So Demas... He's loving the world. He's not setting his affection on things above. He's a saved man. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Demas loved the world. He obviously wasn't showing a changed life. He had some sin going on just by not setting his affection on things above. But Paul wasn't doubting his salvation. To judge a person's salvation off of a changed life, you are going to have to see this person's life from the beginning of their salvation to the end maybe they showed a changed life years ago and recently picked up an old pet sin or maybe they haven't yielded themselves to the holy spirit's guidance yet and they're going to later to walk in the spirit you're going to have to consistently pray read the word of god and follow what it says to live right i have to get up every morning read the bible pray even listen to some good christian music uh, read the Bible different times throughout the day, continue to pray, and if I quit that stuff, I'm going to be awful. I'm going to think horrible thoughts. I'm going to be irritable and angry. Uh, I can't do it without the Bible. I can't do it without praying. Maybe you're so good that you can, but I can't. When a man bases his own salvation off of his changed life, what will he do if he slips back into an old sin? I would wonder what these changed life guys would think if the devil got in their life, hurt one of their family members, hurt their ministry, and they got depressed, got down, and slipped back into an old sin. Do they think it's impossible to be, to be tempted by the devil and go back into that same sin that they were committing before they were saved? That is being, you're thinking that you're better than you really are. Uh, the changed life re required for salvation teachers will eventually get to a point, and I have seen this, not all of them do this, but they will get to a point where they have a list of certain sins that a Christian can't and will not commit. And it's just crazy. They'll have a sin, list of sins saying a Christian will not curse, a Christian will not fornicate a christian will not do such and such when paul had that list of sins in galatians chapter 5 that said envy and uh wrath and strife was on, and variance was on that list and he had on the list the sins that that man was sent this man had a list of sins a christian won't commit and it was sins that was listed in galatians chapter 5 of paul warning christians not to commit how does that make sense but at the same time, we want a balanced view on this subject. We don't want to base our salvation off outward evidence because what I believe is and I, what I believe the Bible teaches is that works before salvation don't have anything to do with your salvation. Works after salvation don't have anything to do with your salvation. But at the same time, we want to do works and we do want to show outward evidence. We want to be saved on the inside, and we want to show that we're saved on the outside. Even though I don't believe you can judge a person's salvation off their works, why would you choose to act like a devil all the time? You want to live like a saved person should live, doing what the Bible says. Living wicked is a horrible testimony to the lost world and a discouragement to other Christians. Nothing good comes from a Christian sinning. 
And also there are those who teach against the changed life requirement for salvation. Just like I'm teaching against it. I don't believe it's required. But at the same time, these same men that teach against the changed life, a lot of them, they'll say it is a works-based salvation, which it seems like it is. Not as bad as some other works-based salvation. But it does seem like a change, or it does seem like a works-based salvation to say that you have to have a changed life. And but yet these same men who teach against it, they will condemn the men who teach a changed life is required. They will say that these men who teach this false doctrine aren't saved themselves. But this is you're doing the same thing if you say that you're saying that a man isn't saved because he's teaching a heresy. In Galatians chapter 5, one of the works of the flesh was heresies. A Christian still has the flesh, and if a work of the flesh is, a he is heresies, then he can still teach a heresy. A Christian can be very deceived and deceived a whole bunch of other people. Um, uh, just because a person teaches to change life is required doctrine doesn't mean this man is not saved. It just means he is teaching heresies, which is a work of the flesh, according to that long list of sins Paul gives in Galatians chapter 5. And I believe the majority of the ones teaching this doctrine are saved and have just been taught wrong and are teaching wrong and have been believing wrong. When you get saved, you aren't invincible against deception. I'm probably deceived on some things right now and don't even know about it. You're deceived on something, I'm sure of it. You can be deceived and in turn deceive others unknowingly. When you think that you're not deceived somehow, in some way, you're being overconfident in yourself. You haven't got your glorified body yet. You still have the sinful flesh. And unless you stay in the Bible and stay in fellowship with God, then there ain't no telling what's going to happen to you. In Ephesians Chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul says, Let no man deceive you. He's talking to Christians. A Christian can be deceived. But lastly, I don't believe a changed life is required for salvation because the sin nature won't leave until the rapture. Until we are raptured and get a glorified body, we will have the same sinful flesh. 1 Corinthians 15 52 through 55 talks about in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be changed. We're going to get a new body. This corruptible is going to put on incorruption. This The mortal is going to put on immortality. And our bodies need to be changed because they are sinful, fleshly bodies. We can yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, meaning we can give our body over to unrighteous things. All unrighteousness is sin. And then Romans six eleven through 12 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. He's talking to Christians when he says that. If the Christian can let sin reign in his mortal body and obey it in the lust thereof, then he's not going to show outward evidence. Paul shows that a Christian can let sin reign. And this wouldn't be showing a changed life in front of the other Christians. Romans six thirteen and through 16 says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, un of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or whether or of obedience unto righteousness? And then in Ephesians four twenty two through 24 it says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, you have to put on the new man. Don't listen to the old man that wants to do the bad things. Yield 
yourself to the Holy Spirit and His guidance. It's possible for a Christian to not listen to what the Holy Spirit says and then just do whatever they want. The new man is Jesus Christ who comes to live in you when you get saved and the old man is the flesh. It is a battle to put off the old man. And the changed life guys seem to sometimes forget the two natures of the believer. Just like the holiness crowd forgets it completely. They just don't understand it. And the people who believe you can lose your salvation. They don't get the two natures of, of the believer. They don't understand that the soul is saved. And the body is a dead corpse. Uh, and now with all this being said, we can clearly see that we can't teach every Christian will have a changed life because he is a new creature. His flesh isn't new. It's the same old sinful stuff. And there are some things that are new for the Christian. When you get saved, there are some things that definitely are different and changed and new. At salvation, he gets the Holy Spirit. You didn't have that before you were saved. You were spiritually circumcised at salvation. You didn't have that. You have a new outlook at sin, on sin. You're ashamed of it. You didn't have that before like you do now. And even now, your conscience can be seared after salvation if you stay in unconfessed sin. The more you do a sin and don't confess it, it's going to get easier and easier and easier to commit that sin. And this would make you less ashamed of that sin. But I hope this study has given you assurance of salvation. I don't ever want to talk anyone out of their salvation that doesn't, that has salvation. And I don't want to talk anyone into salvation that doesn't have it. If you haven't ever came to a time in your life when you realized your guilt of sin, realized you couldn't save yourself, and came to Jesus Christ for salvation then you're not saved if you've never done that. You are yet in your sins. And while we can't prove who is saved and who isn't saved by outward works, if you are living like the devil and you don't care what the Bible says and you aren't ashamed of your sin, it would be a good idea for you to check yourself. Make sure that you're saved. Have you really been saved? I can't judge and say, you've not been saved because of how you're living. You only know that you're saved and God only knows. Eternity is a long time and you will burn in hell for eternity if you're not saved. If you realize your guilt of sin and you know you can't save yourself and you have the desire to come to Jesus Christ for salvation, then do it today before it's too late. Don't wait and don't wait until you go to church. Do it now because you could die before the day's over. But this has been... The study on is a changed life required for salvation.